Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and if I hated you, this would be happiness and kids. <laughs> but gladly, Michael's here, and so it's not happiness and kids. It's, yep. a, it's a show that would not make our listeners kill themselves. That's true. What, uh, what do we got today? Today, uh, we're doing Sucker Punch and the Switchblade Sisters. Oh, so what you're telling me is we're getting towards the end of the year, and yeah. uh, it seems to be about time for a woman in prison. Uh, yeah, sometimes you just type gotta... Type of double feature. You gotta chuck in your woman in prison. Chuck your women in prison. Feminism. This is a show about feminism, believe that or not. Uh, we're going to spoil both Sucker Punch and Switchblade Sisters. Mm-hmm. You can use the chapters, obviously, if in the show. If spoilers bother you, you can just chapter right the fuck on over. Yeah, if you haven't seen these two movies, just, you know what, save them. Uh, skip to the movie you have seen. In the meantime, let's talk Sucker Punch. So now we've covered a couple Zack Snyder things on the yeah, show. Yeah, we did Dawn of the Dead, mm-hmm. and we did uh, we did 300. We did 300 as well. Zack Snyder, I mean, this is a, a really interesting movie to think about, you know, him as a director mm-hmm. or a, a content creator. Right. Because when you had Dawn of the Dead, that's a Romero film. Sure. Right? It's a he's, remake. I mean, he's that's... redoing, yeah. He's redoing a Romero film, and it's great. Yeah. But uh, then he does 300. Mm-hmm. It's an original film. But that's a Frank Miller film. Based on a, it's based on a graphic novel. I mean... It the, had existed beforehand. Right. And then, of course, there was uh, Watchmen he did as Again, well, which is... based uh, on graphic novel. You got it. So these things all existed somewhere, maybe not in the film world, but somewhere before he did them. Sucker Punch is his first all-original film. And that's probably what made me the most excited... Yeah, uh, me too. ...to see sure. it when it came out. Hey, finally, Zack Snyder's doing something all his own. He didn't write it himself personally... But it was written for cinema and, right. and for him to, uh, to create. And it kind of uses this, uh, this interesting template that I don't know if we've touched on really that much in the show. This kind of Wizard of Oz template. Yeah. You know, it comes up a little bit anytime we do any sort of escapist uh, film. And I guess that's, that's a lot of cinema, right, is escapism. But it's, it's a fantasy within a reality. Mm-hmm. It's someone retreating to another world. But the great thing about the Wizard of Oz template is that the fantasy has implications on reality. So anytime we watch a film, we're always watching, you know, some sort of fantasy in, right. in one way or another. Sure. Because we ourselves are escaping for an hour and a half or what have you into a film. We're watching somebody else's world. We're watching exploration for, mm-hmm. for that amount of time. So if we were to set up a movie where somebody else is essentially watching a movie yeah. for an hour and a half. That needs some kind of purpose. Mm-hmm. And so Wizard of Oz says, hey, let's, uh, let's have somebody in a dire situation, and um, we're going to have them escape to their fantasy and show later these kind of implications right. on reality. And so a lot of films have, have uh, picked that up and kind of run with that, and that's definitely what Sucker Punch is doing. I mean, we have this kind of bookend concept sure. uh, where we have the items in the beginning, and the implications at the end, which is beautifully done. I mean, you have uh, in your entrance, you know, when, when she first comes to the um, correctional ward, there's those focal shots on mm-hmm. the items. You get the map and the fire and the, what is it, the knife and the key? Knife right? and the key, yeah. And it's very deliberate, very obvious. Here are the items that are going to be used. And in any other film, I mean, this is what we created hamster style for. Sure. Right? This yeah, is, uh, absolutely. Wasn't that there was the Freddy movie that I, <laughs> I think back to all the time is running around collecting all the oh, items yeah. and then having a hamster style montage. And instead of just feeling like a, a hamster style here, I feel like we're getting the chapters to this incredible journey. Yeah, it's more of a roadmap than it is a bullshit hamster style. Movie. For sure. For sure. Plus, the other thing that's really interesting to consider, I mean, talk about bookends. Mm. We get the that introductory thing with the lobotomy. Yeah, right. And the film kind of takes place in the course of what, two a seconds? A fraction of a second. Yeah. yeah, really. Well, yeah, so that's our uh, our additional layer. So this is kind of an interesting spin then on that Wizard of Oz concept because we have her initial reality. But then on top of that, she retreats into this kind of fantasy brothel environment 
And then that even has its own, you know, layer to it. Right. Because during these dances, there's an additional element of even heightened fantasy. So Snyder's giving you this sort of, uh, these steps, this sort of staircase down into the craziest of, of fantasies. It's one thing just to imagine you work in a brothel, and that's, that's obvious escapism. But um, the fantasy world that she creates in her head is so fucking bad, it necessitates its own fantasy. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it does two things. It allows Snyder to play around in crazy gaming world. Uh, when we get to the lowest level of that fantasy, when we get to fighting robots and ninja swords and all that. But it also says, you know what? In Baby Doll's head, she has, in, in the moment before her uh, lobotomy, she's created a fantasy, and even that world is so crappy, it needs its own fantasy. <laughs> the dances, you know, make her right. feel so either so bad or so empowered, or maybe both. That, you know, that's where she escapes to. Or maybe that's where she has to go to. Maybe yeah, that's... I think that's kind of, they kind of talk about that when they're learning the dance and how mm. it's supposed, she's teaching them to, quote, survive. Yeah, right. The dance is a defense mechanism, I think. Yeah, maybe it's not uh, even so much another place she has to escape to. She doesn't appear to hate the dance. Right. But that's where she goes in her head to, uh, to create that place. What I love about these dances is the very obvious, very deliberate, you know, you never we see talk them. about them, we don't see them. It's so well done because they stick to it. They allude to the dances, they talk about, you know, you were just mentioning, they literally have chat sessions about right. the dances. There's a dance instruction. They make you really think about it and kind of want to see it, even though the place you're retreating to is obviously so infinitely better it's, uh, yeah, visually than... it's got to be way cooler than any dance like i cannot imagine short of maybe um tracy ullman's dance from the uh the uh, hokey pokey scene in a dirty oh, shame yeah, right unless that is part of baby doll's dance <laughs> sure. i don't think it could possibly top giant samurais well you know what i think is really well done is that somehow in the writing they convince you that you do want to see the dance yeah it's true they go oh it's it's incredibly sexual and raw they they almost scoff at her like wow that's just so sexual and right raw. Well, i mean it's hypnotic yeah it, and whenever anything is the kind of thing where the person watching it loses sense of reality. Yeah. You want to see it. Sure, sure. Well, that and you come back and when you get out of the fantasy world, you kind of look around the room. You're prepared to come back from, say, the, the initial, you know, ninja sure. fight. You're prepared to come back in that room and go, ha ha, fuck you guys. I just got to see something really awesome while you were just hanging out in a sweaty dance room. Right. But then you see everybody staring at her and kind of sure. going wow, I'm so glad we got to see that yeah. and nobody missed it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Suddenly you're a little jealous. You're like, well, well, hey, wait, wait a second. I saw the samurai thing, but w what happened over here? And you know, if you feel those dances are a kind of mental retreat, uh, even from her own fantasy, I think the, the movie does give you a reason to believe that. I mean, when you get that whole processing scene, you know, in the theater, it kind of feels like, remember when we did Kill Bill? Yeah. The, uh, we talked about the lube scene in there. Yeah. You know, when she gets in there with her attacker checking her in, the whole... It's uh, like stepdad or... Fucked up, surreal kind of moment. The priest. And, you know, it's that scene with the, the Pixies cover. It's really, I mean, it's so desperate. You know, they're talking about, oh, we'll just forge a signature on these lobotomy papers. I've done it a bunch of times. She right. won't know what hit her. Everything will be fine. You'll be in the clear. Talking about, we don't know what you did to this girl. I mean, you, in much the same way in Kill Bill, you almost whimper out loud yeah. for that character. You just feel so bad. But man, even though I think back to it now, that's still, that's still layer one. That's still yeah. normal reality. Right. <laughs> oh, awful. It's just funny that her uh, her fantasy immediately takes her back to that room. That's where she goes. Yeah. So another thing that makes this obviously pretty interesting for Snyder is that one of his biggest movies previous to this was 300. Right. I mean, he started working on Sucker Punch immediately after 300, or uh, at least before Watchmen, and kind of had to take a break to, to do the Watchmen stuff. But he moves from what's essentially an all-male cast to an all-female cast. Sure. And this is a female cast of... I mean, nearly descent proportion, if not girl interrupted. Yeah. Right. It's uh, it's somewhere kind of between that thing. And when you have an all female cast, as we've examined several times on the show, and something we really love in movies. Sure. That, and we'll get to. I mean, we'll even get to it in Switchblade Sisters. Absolutely. And we'll we'll kind of see the other thing. You know, these movies fall in generally they fall in two camps. 
you have a, a camp where it's it's kind of exploiting women or one where it's incredibly highbrow and you know well written talky kind of sure. girl interrupted right yeah. that was girl right. interrupted so we have something like uh, when we get to Switchblade Sisters, obviously an exploitation movie, and we'll explore what that does, or the kind of opposite girl interrupted side. When we talked uh, The Descent, we did a little bit of both. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was uh, lowbrow monster horror or whatever, but then it was also incredibly well-written, believable, dynamic sure. characters. Yeah. I like to think that Sucker Punch kind of plays in both camps in a, a bit of a different way. I mean, it's a highbrow, almost a commentary on the lowbrow, you know, in existing as what appears to be a fetish movie. Sure. It says a lot of things uh, to comment, maybe even criticize this female ninja fantasy gaming thing rather than be a complete love letter to it. Right. But also maybe it's a little bit of a love it, letter too. It's weird because I, I remember when I first saw the film, mm -hmm. I was honestly just expecting swords and samurais and dragons and hot chicks and schoolgirl outfits right i didn't expect the film to have any heart sure outside i mean you know what i mean we yeah, both absolutely. know what kind of films i like and what kind of films we like sure, on sure. double feature so the film would have heart and it would have meaning mm -hmm. but i didn't expect it to carry this sort of weight sure that sucker punch does carry I expected it to just be the dance sequences the whole time. Yeah, right, right. But those are really just tiny segments of what the film is actually doing. Yeah, Snyder's always been one to uh, appeal to that sense of just basic childhood violence, uh, gore, action, aesthetic, but use filmmaking craft and tools for that and right. make very pleasing looking and feeling films. And we've talked about that in his other movies, especially in talking about 300. But when we get to something like this, he's also using those, you know, the same kind of childish appeal. Uh, he's using those tools to, to talk to that audience in that language. Right. There's very basic things that I think makes this movie appeal in a feministic way and in a, uh, in like you were saying, a deeper, more heartfelt kind of way. You know, when you look at this being, all right, it definitely has those elements of being a, a love letter fetish movie, something that says, I love this culture. But then on a mental level, we're celebrating all this stuff until reality checks in. Right. You know, I think that's one of the reasons for these layers of fantasy. At the deepest layer, we are saying, here is just this action. It's, it's appealing to a different part of the brain. And then every once in a while, reality kicks back in and we talk about kind of in our own heads without getting it terribly preachy in the movie, what role that plays in our own society. You know, we have these girls in uh, schoolgirl uniforms fighting robots or whatever. And then we kind of come back and every time that that other layer of reality sets in, everyone dies painfully and the main protagonist gets yeah. stabbed in the face. Right. You know what I mean? There definitely is a reality check every so often. And uh, I don't think we're extrapolating too much to say that that reality check is the commentary. It's mm -hmm. kind of saying, well, what role do these things play in our own society? Why does a, a fetishistic movie exist? When we did Exit Through the Gift Shop on this show, we talked about projecting your own meaning rather than finding the meaning in a movie. Right. And uh, as we watched this uh, this week, actually, I watched this movie fucking twice this week. Yeah. Something I really strive to do is figure out what Zack Snyder is doing here rather than just placing my own meaning on sure. a lot of these things. Because I feel like Snyder has an, an even better understanding of this movie than I could ever attempt to attribute right. to it. One of the big conversations that came out of this that interested me, and something that obviously interested him too, was, is the movie pro-feminist or anti-feminist? Because, you know, a lot of times you or I do an exploitation movie here. Sure. I imagine when we do Switchblade Sisters... Uh, you and I will hold it up as, isn't this cool? These chicks are kicking ass. Right. And that says something great about women. And maybe it doesn't actually, but we <laughs> like to think about it that way. And we can find excuses too. Right. And I didn't want to do that with Sucker Punch. I wanted to know really at the heart of it, because that's what people say about it being, you know, anti-feminist. Sure. Because you can make these tired, timeless kind of claims in either direction, the same way as you talk about, uh, does pornography empower women or does it right. destroy women? Exactly. But I know that Zack Snyder views this as his, really his feminist epic. 
and I wanted to get to the the answers uh, on that. I think one of the biggest claims people make against it are the outfits. I mean, that's the most obvious. Sure. When you look at this movie, all you have to do is see the poster. And were you not familiar enough with women's rights groups, you might think this is the sort of thing they would lobby against. Yeah. And, you know, there are people that speak out against this for that reason. Yeah. For some reason, a lot of people are hung up with hot chicks. Mm-hmm. Hot chicks. In, and I mean that as a phrase. Sure. Well, use the language of the film. That's fine. Hot chicks. Hot chicks uh, really upset feminist people sometimes. Well, they do. They do. You know, uh, the costumes that they're using in this, and to me, it never bothered me because I always thought, first of all, it's hard for me to objectively think about this movie because the costumes are seriously my favorite fetish outfits. I mean, how do you be objective about that? But uh, Snyder talked in a lot of interviews about Moulin Rouge and about uh, kind of stage and theater. There's a fucking theater in the movie. So having these girls in costumes, that always made sense to me. That never bothered me. It seems like one of those things that might bother people who never actually saw the movie. Yeah. But there were people who saw the movie and were upset by that. And Snyder would argue that, you know, he didn't actually dress those girls that way. The audience did. And it was kind of this question about... Why do those outfits even exist societally, right? That's, that's sure. where that commentary comes in. That's the same thing we could wonder about exploitation. What does it say about our culture that something like this exists? And so we're not just examining an exploitation movie. We're watching Snyder examine an exploitation movie. We're watching him go, okay, what is the nature of a brothel? Why does sure. a brothel exist? Why in this stage play? Sweet Pea, it's the first fucking thing she says. She says, are you kidding me? We're really going to do this. Yeah. Like, I get sexy schoolgirl, yeah. and that's all cute and fun for Halloween and whatever. But uh, isn't this kind of fucked up, what we're doing right here? And I don't think a lot of people got that. But in retrospect, it seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. that's, that's deliberately what we're talking about. But then there's the, the additional level of we're taking it back, which is sure. always an interesting part of exploiting something or uh, celebrating the exploitation of something. This is that type of empowerment. You know, these outfits are symbols. Uh, Snyder calls them power icons, Mm -hmm. right? That you could could wear this schoolgirl outfit and you could say, you know, this is something that in the brothel, in the the second uh, layer here, they do this to put on a show and entertain and maybe they're oppressed there. But even in their own minds, the outfits are perhaps even tackier than they are in that subjective uh, fantasy in that second level fantasy, you know, the girls are retreating then. And they're saying, as we're performing these fight sequences uh, in baby doll's mind, as we're doing all of these fights, sure. We're going to use those fucking schoolgirl outfits. Right. We will show them who's boss in even worse outfits than they choose to dress us. Right. In. While you might look at this movie and it's not the clearest example of feminism, it's uh, it's a more complex um, dialogue about feminism in that way. But my gut reaction is that you still get empowerment from this movie. Mm -hmm. It's asking why can't women be sexy while being warriors? You know, no one questions that about a movie like 300. Sure. I assume I'm a heterosexual guy. What the fuck do I know? But if you had a bunch of men beating each other up, I don't know. Speedos is that it's always safer to have less clothing. But I mean, does the audience who would be attracted to men, do they come out of 300 thinking that's a bunch of sexy guys? Have you heard a bunch of sexy guys in reference to 300? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the, the same kind of, I, you know, the reason I even have that question is because nobody goes, that's the exploitation of men. Brutish, you know, grunting warriors. Sure. Nobody came out of there. And part of that is that men are not a minority. They've never really been oppressed. You know, yeah. that's a broad umbrella. But uh, so that, that question maybe doesn't come up. But we're doing the same thing as 300 here. Sure. We're putting people in a very appealing light and we're having them, you know, be warriors. And even the actresses, you know, interviewed about this movie said they had a lot of fun dressing up, being really sexy and doing fight choreography. It's uh, it's sex and violence. It's satisfying both of those primal urges at once. And as human beings in a voluntary situation, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's fantastic that we choose to do that. Yeah. So this movie does it in a couple other ways, too. I mean, you have the, the songs. So music, obviously, is, is mm-hmm. a big part of this. But you'll notice that the songs, not accidentally, are all female covers. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not all of them. But actually, the, the point where you get that mashup, the, uh, the Armageddon one of um, I Want It All and We Will Rock You. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have the same reaction as I do, but it feels, man, it feels invasive. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the first time you have like men singing. It feels oppressive. These are disgusting playboys. With the placement of where that is in the movie with everybody kind of coming in and the big money and right. the fucking smoking the cigar. I mean, yeah. that's what we're meant to believe, right? Disgusting playboys. Yeah, exactly. For as important as that piece then is to feeling oppressive and setting the mood at that point, it comes nowhere near uh, Sweet Dreams for me. Yeah. I think, man, the the first five minutes and 18 seconds of this fucking movie is possibly, in my mind, the best thing Zack Snyder has ever done. Yeah, I can Nothing, see that. There is no go-to for me that just says, oh, you want to watch a single Zack Snyder scene? What embodies everything he's into and, and shows him at his very best? Especially his more recent obsession through this and Watchmen with uh, with music and sure. you know how that changes the mood or yeah. sets an additional level of the film as Sweet Dreams. It should just be the extended trailer for the movie. I mean, the you know that organ first swells up as we're we're going into it, as if to say, "Oh, just wait, this is going to be awesome." You know, when you first get that thick wall of sound. And then the drums kick in. It provokes a, I mean, honestly, a very physical reaction in me. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes the the hair stand up on the back of your neck. This is something that we talked about a little bit uh, in Twenty Eight Weeks Later, too. You know, we spent a large part of that episode just talking about the first couple minutes of that movie, where we had, you know, the the John Murphy sure. score that was derivative of the of the first movie. It's that kind of swelling in music, and I love that. I love that just ongoing climax. The song keeps getting bigger. In this version of Sweet Dreams that they do, there's enough of a lull in the middle, just enough to do it all over again yeah. at the very end. Right. Just kind of amp it up one more time, bring this thing to this constant crescendo. Uh, it's really fantastic. And Emily Browning does the, <laughs> the fucking vocal for it, which is the best part, right? So she plays Baby Doll, and... um you know, the other thing I love about Sweet Dreams opening this movie is she doesn't actually have any dialogue till we get to the ward. Right. You know what I mean? She For the first half hour of the movie, she doesn't say anything. She's just sad and angry. Yeah, so our introduction to our main character's voice is Sweet Dreams. I mean, right. that's how we learn about her. We don't hear her talk uh, for a, a good portion of the movie following that. She um she actually does three songs that are on the soundtrack, and yeah. I think that's really cool that there's a couple actors yep. from this that you know that's doing the the music to what became a a pretty highly successful soundtrack. Sure, one of those soundtracks that you may even consider to be more successful than the film itself. They obviously put a lot of time and dedication into that. There's all the songs they selected for this; they're picked really well. It's all about you know escapism. It's about that big theme from fantasy. Sure. Movie. You have Sweet Dreams, right? Obviously, yeah. that's talking about dreams. Oh, White Rabbit being the kind of mm -hmm. Alice in Wonderland uh, reference this plays yeah, I on. I fucking love that song. But even the Pixies cover, Where's My Mind? Yeah. Right? Everything that's just about too on the nose. Yeah. You know, stuff like Asleep or even uh, Love is the Drug. I, when you go to Love is the Drug being the most loosely related one, it's still comparing love to a drug. It's right. still fucking escapism. I mean, every number just hits it. Army of Me, though, I, oh, fuck, that's her transformation song, Army yeah. of Me. We get to that point, I'm just thinking, you have got to be kidding me. Dude, this movie is my fucking wet dream before we even get to the fetish gaming world for yeah. things like this. We talked about Army of Me before on the show. I don't know if you remember, all the way back in Tank Girl, it was also oh used. Oh my God, it is. Yeah, and, uh, and then in this movie, and the thing that makes it even more exciting, it's just good to hear that, you know, cranking. It's such a... For Bjork, especially after doing that, um, the first album she did where yeah. everything was a little more uh, subtle, I guess is yeah. a weird word to use for Bjork, comparatively subtle. Army of Me starts that second album is just ass kicking. And, uh, and we move right into that with the movie. But in the version of Army of Me, and the thing that got me really excited is although it starts the same way, it's reworked. So there is this extended kind of verse. There's more crazy in it. There's more grunty, crazy right. Bjork. And as far as I can tell, she recorded new parts for this, for the movie. I wish uh, it's double feature show at gmail.com. If you have any information on this, it's really, really hard to find. I've never heard anything like this before the movie came out as far as where those vocal parts came from. And it's a, uh, you know, it's labeled as a Sucker Punch remix, as something that was composed specifically for this movie. 
they move in and out of that army of me scene by focusing on the stereo. You get the close ups of the stereo mm -hmm. when it's turned on, which I think is really great. It makes you a lot more um, focused on the music because there's that visual cue. It's right in front of you. You literally see someone turning on a stereo right. as if to say, we worked really hard on this, this next part, pay close attention. That's the audio style. The visual style is somebody we've never gotten to talk about on the show. And I'm really excited about this too. Uh, a lot of the visuals were done by Alex Party, who a lot of people don't know, but you've seen his work. I mean, uh, he did artwork for, I've talked about Cage a couple times on, on the show, the guy who does hip hop, and he also does some metal stuff. Um, I don't listen to the used, but he did a lot of their, so you know those covers, right? Sure, you've yeah. seen those. They're really inky, like bloody heart kind of, mm -hmm. all of that stuff is Alex Party stuff or a lot of it is Alex Party stuff. So you're probably familiar with it. You've seen it. His artwork is this, uh, it's this style I really love. It's this combination of kind of, you know, slasher films, street art, and maybe Todd McFarlane. Yeah. You know, that messy, pouring, inky kind of design. And it, it's great. We'll link off to it. He, um, he's got a couple things online, uh, Zero Friends, which is a art community he works with. And then uh, he's got a blog where he writes up a lot of his stuff. He has a lot of very miscellaneous work. He just kind of, you know, goes in whatever direction his art takes him. So that blog is a really good way to find out, like, whether he's doing... Uh, similar to when we talk about Rob Sheridan, works with Nine Inch Nails, also has his own, you know, digital paintings, also does stuff for films now. So it's the same kind of thing with Alex Pardee where, I mean, he has a lot of uh, albums, but he's also done a lot of uh, painting and stuff by hand. He's done a lot of shirt designs. More recently, he started doing uh, an animated show. He, he did a really great, um, we did Attack the Block on this show. He did a yeah. really great Attack the Block. You've seen that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the one with the, awesome. the glowing, th oh, it's great. Some Hatchet 2 art, some Reanimator art, so a lot of really good stuff. You can best see his work in this movie, I think, if you look at the uh, the painted bunny mech kind of thing. <laughs> you know, that's a great example of Alex Party. He started doing the early promo stuff for this movie, and then, uh, you know, Snyder ended up asking him to design the katana that Baby Doll uses. And from there, he kind of fell into concept art and prop design and set design for the whole fucking thing. So, I mean, I don't even really need to say the visual style is something to, to be appreciated. I think yeah. everybody who comes out of Sucker Punch, you know, really does. Even in the shots you wouldn't expect. You get these larger than life kind of wide shots. Yeah, baby doll scrubbing the floor in the beginning. You know, yeah. everything about Zack Snyder's movies feel theatrical. It always feels like film. It's, it's always, true. it's an experience every yeah. time you go to one of these things. Scrubbing the floor, the five item speech, the most transparent screenwriting of all right. time. If it was any more transparent, it would probably be meta. You know, here's our outline. And the last thing, by the way, the last item is a cinematic surprise. Yeah. Set pieces too, like the the World War One kind of you know, anytime I see the World War One stuff, I think about the darkness. I mean, that comes up on our show all the time. But they're talking in the in the script about, you know, being powered by uh, what is it? Steam power and clockwork. Steam power and clockworks. Yeah. And you get steam instead of blood, which is visually a really cool right. choice. And the the Jenna Malone pistol whip and that World War One sequence is probably one of my favorite. Just the action, everything about that. You know, we could deconstruct that whole scene. There's just a bunch of great stuff in there. This is ultimately this is what I wish when people talk about Hollywood movies or big budget movies. I don't get a lot of joy out of that. I yeah. wish things like Sucker Punch were. I wish this was the new Hollywood. I agree fully. So this was a pretty long conversation uh, about a movie that people usually brush off. Yeah. This could have been a 20-minute longer conversation had we done the 20-minute longer version <laughs> of Sucker Punch. We, uh, for the show, watched the PG-13 rated one. That's the one that most people have seen. But Snyder actually did something kind of strange. He put out an R-rated version on the Blu-ray. Not huh. an unrated cut but one that they actually submitted and, and got an R rating, which makes me think that that was the cut, you know, he originally put in for, and it didn't make it, they cut it down to PG, and rather than just throw a bunch of extra stuff in and go unrated, they actually used the original R cut. That would be what I would surmise, but it's about 20 minutes longer, it's got more violence, more dancing. Uh, there's a sex scene, actually, with the high roller, that's probably the most important thing for us to talk about. It changes the... Um, the vibe of the ending a little bit to make it more her decision yeah. to fuck the high roller, 
which you get that uh you know when we bring john hammond uh at the end who's in uh mad men and yeah. the town people probably recognize him from that stuff he says that thing about it's like she wanted me to do it which is a little strange and confusing at the end but the way it originally ends is that there's kind of this association in this sex scene right before that of fucking him and then the lobotomy. So he ends up playing the high roller. Sure. And uh, there's this great kind of moment of empowerment where she makes this very deliberate choice to have sex with him to save Sweet Pea. It's her acceptance of that lobotomy. Right. And then it makes more sense, you know, when they cut sure. to uh, pounding the spike into her, her fucking face. But it's still great the way they cut to that in the movie. Where are you going? And then just the action shots, like the beginning, you know, like the light bulb going out. It's that last kick in the face before the movie's over. It's really difficult going from talking about the visuals and the wonderful aesthetic of Sucker Punch and then moving into Switchblade Sisters, which sure. is, I mean, it's just a 70s fucking exploitation film. It's well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say dirty. just, I would say it's an I, Well, I mean that in a good way. I know you do. I but know you I'm do. just saying it's, it's... So this is Switchblade Sisters and not the Jezebels? It's not the Jezebels anymore. It's I don't funny because I found it, it the other the day in the dictionary and... yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think the IMDb page even calls us the Jezebels. Yeah. That was another title they wanted for it or whatever. But here's where we come down on this stuff. Uh, a lot of times we have movies with a couple different titles. Yeah, we watch a lot of exploitation movies, and the going rate for exploitation films is if it didn't do that well, change the name and put it out again. Put it out again, yeah. If the title is displayed literally in the title sequence, that's the title. End yeah. of argument. This movie is called Switchblade Sisters. This is, man, this is a, uh, it's a perfect type of late night movie. Yeah. You know, we didn't watch it particularly late, but it feels that way. It feels like we're doing midnight stuff. It's not the action type of midnight movie. You know, it's not Planet Terror. It's more of this, uh, this chill midnight flick. It's just perfect for that. We're just hanging out with uh, Lenny Bruce's daughter, you know, yeah. enjoying the show. <laughs> Lenny Bruce is really hip. We're not going to really have any reason to talk about him on this show because it's just his daughter here. But he's one of those, you know, influential figures in uh, in the best type of modern comedy. You know, right. all those guys look back to his stuff. One name that does need to come up is uh, Mr. Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Well, Quentin Tarantino had this thing that he did in the uh, in the late 90s and I guess early 2Ks uh, called Rolling Thunder Pictures, mm. which is named after the film we covered on the show, Rolling Thunder. Awesome. Rolling Thunder Pictures is Quentin Tarantino's kind of leg up to all the films from the 70s that he was a huge fan of that sure. never got any sort of dvd release right so what ends up happening is he picks a movie like switchblade sisters like rolling thunder like detroit 9000 and uh he puts them out he releases them on these dvds but all the dvds have his face on them and <laughs> none of them have menus i mean it's it's really as Basic. exploitative as possible yeah it's exploitative yeah. and basic i mean every single dvd starts with quentin tarantino kind of in a room he just looks broken down I sure. mean, he's just yeah switchblade sisters is this movie uh it's really a good movie or something um i hope i wish you, people could see the gestures you're making hope you enjoy it's perfect. it and um but how could we complain? I mean, listen to the this right. lineup. These are all movies we've done on the show. These are sure. such great selections. And then for him to pick the same fucking movies to put out on this uh, this line, oh, it's great. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't knock the result. No, I not at all. I can't actually. I can't knock the intent either. No way to go, Tarantino. Thanks, man. He's doing a really good thing. I just wish his face wasn't all over it. Yeah, you know, you got to get people to find out about these movies it's somehow. True. Uh, if you get digital copies, see, I'm totally unaware of all this. You still grab DVDs from time to time. Every now and again, yeah. I uh, I haven't seen a DVD in a while, so I had no idea Quentin Tarantino anything until you told me that. Yeah. Although I thought Rolling Thunder was kind of kind of strange. Yeah. I was like, hey, I remember that. It's a movie not uh, entirely unlike Reform School Girls. Sure. When we talked about that, 
or uh, Weasel. He seems like he's from the the. I don't know if you've ever seen the Malcolm McDowell film. Um, if no. it was one of his early films. But we're talking Jack Hill stuff again here, yeah, right? We're back to Jack Hill. Director Jack Hill, who did Coffee and Foxy Brown, sure. which we did uh, on Big the show. Big Cage. Yeah. Uh, Anything with Pam Greer and Sid Haig. A lot of yay girls kind of movies. Yep. Hooray women. I think it's most like the Big Bird Cage tonally as you know any of his stuff we've ever done. But it's not just a straight women in prison film, as we see with a, a lot of his right. films that draw on sure. those elements. It's just kind of sections of women in prison. And this is a, a great strategy for him because it uses that packaging says, hey, look at this women in prison film. We get it early in this film, really the only time we get it when everybody kind of goes to uh, juvie or the facility correctional. Yeah, I don't know. There's a warden. Who knows what that is? Angry, angry sleep over time. But usually you stay in that prison the right. whole time. I think in uh, in the big birdcage, you even stay in that prison much longer right. than, uh, you know, than you do here. But in actuality, Hill knows it's more exciting to roam around a bit. You know, sure. the, these girls go to a fucking roller rink in this movie. Right. Well, I mean, they need to have switchblades, and you can't have switchblades in prison. There you go. That's the excuse. And what's a girl gang without switchblades? Well, what's a girl gang without their component boy gang? Yeah. Question right. mark. Question mark. Big <laughs> fucking question mark. I like to pretend this is Sin City. I like to pretend these are the girls from Old Town. Yeah. Kind of feels like, um, you know, we didn't talk about it back on the Sin City show. But that those old town girls, I mean, that was that was a girl gang, right? right? That was very women in prison, very switchblade sisters. But this isn't Sin City. This is actually the 1960s Adam West Batman. Yeah. I don't know what happens here <laughs> with the, the music, right? You just expect yeah. wham, pow. Uh, and then the star wipes and the frame flips and sure. the quick fade out, I the mean, transitions. This is, this is classic Jack Hill exploitation. Oh, glory. I mean, this is your drive-in fucking cinema here it's true it really is true but you mentioned the men in this movie yeah and there's a lot that you know the men are one of the things that separate this from the rest of the genre the men in this movie are written like women are written in women in prison films that's true so neither of the genders are written like human beings yeah but the kind of uh never met a woman before in my life way in which sure. women are usually written in these movies uh, I think if this movie does anything feministic, it's portraying all of the characters that way. Yeah. You know, there's that scene where Maggie gives uh, Dom the letter. Right. You know, and the other guy chases him around and kind of teases him, gives that him, right. gives him that little slap on the face. Like, what is that? Yeah. You know, where Sucker Punch was uh, women in a women in prison role, Switchblade Sisters is the women in prison women in a women in prison role. Yeah. And the true. men too. It's the, it's the both yeah. of those. But the men are all dumb and they're all flat and they all, they just don't really have any functional purpose other than to be dicks. Yeah, it's That's true. Really? They're just kind of jerks. Well, by making these characters uh, kind of similar this way, when there's that eventual schism, you don't feel like, oh, this might be the, the women gang taking on the, the men. It, they just right. feel like rival gangs at yeah. that point. They're just two separate factions. So all of that stuff stands out to me about Switchblade Sisters, sure. uh, those male roles especially, and how different they tend to be from your usual, I, I mean, usually oppressive uh, warden yeah. kind of roles in um, any sort of female band together type of movie, especially a movie with a female gang or with wardens. Mm -hmm. Much, much different than that stuff. But Switchblade Sisters is also one of those movies where, you know, the, the potential of it far exceeds normal exploitation. Yeah, that's true. The one where that really hits me, the scene where, you know, it's that, uh, that speech, we're going to carve our names in those bastards' chests. I mean, the script is just, it's crying for some kind of remake. Yeah. Not to say there's anything wrong with sure. this movie, obviously, but uh, it, it's just, I would love to shoot that kind of script. Right. Yeah. Well, you, it's its all writ. Everybody is just so fucking fired up. Yeah. Like it's, all the, the characters, I mean, particularly Lace, Patch, and Maggie. Sure. 
those three characters patch so much that uh, Quentin Tarantino just took that character. Sure. Just use that again All later. year long, finding Kill Bill stuff. <laughs> um, all year long. But those three characters in particular are just, they just scream this wonderful dynamic. They really but, do. I mean, yeah. the three of them with each other, but also just individually as characters. They're such strong female roles also i think crabs is possibly one of the most interesting characters <laughs> okay. we've ever touched on sure, sure in uh in double feature history but that's just because i can't really get my head around him yeah because there's a weird kind of maoistic sure almost you know like a weird dictator thing where sure. he seems to be running for office but yeah. he's in high school and it's part of the strange politics. Yeah, the movie I can't will figure out what is up. going on with him, but he's kind of, I don't feel like he's the bad guy. Right. I just feel like he's the face of the enemy. Well, these characters are written so larger than life that they stand out from the rest of the run of the mill things you would expect from exploitation. The thing that keeps it in this genre. The reason in my head when I see that scene and I go, oh, cool, remake time is uh, had we attempted to make this movie something other than it is, being perfect as what it is, Sure. Uh, had we put um, a little more time, if it were more deliberately focused on style, there is a lot to work with Yeah. in just bringing all of the other elements of the film up to where those characters are written, up to... I mean, not that they're incredibly complicated characters, but they are all so fucking boss. You know, that scene, or I, when Maggie pulls the uh, the so-called dirty trick on Patch. Yeah. You know, despite the fact that this isn't masterful action in this scene, uh, how the characters are posed and everything, this is what you expect from yeah. exploitation acting. You still feel how boss that's written. You feel what that's really, yeah. what that was in the writer's head. And uh, and even, you know, a plot point like that, that sets up the conflict between Patch and Maggie. Sure. So instead of her just not liking her because she's the new girl, which right. is what we always do in these films, the script goes, hey, um, she doesn't like her because the way she proved herself to this gang was by putting her in her place, by one-upping her. That feels way more legitimate sure. to me than the, the former out of, oh, you're new, I don't like you. <laughs> Which is a thing that happens in life and oh, totally yeah. a fine thing to do in your movie. But now you feel like you're let in on the history of these characters. Right. You know they have a, a past. So we, we did, I mean, we did an entire Jack Hill episode. It was more, a, I guess it was more a Pam Greer's tits episode. No, but, there was some Jack Hill in there. Okay. Come on now. Well, that was uh, when we did Coffee and Foxy Brown. Sure. And Jack Hill is, he's big. I mean, he's, he loves Pam Greer. Yeah. So Switchblade Sisters can't go without its black power moment, sure, sure. Uh, which results in possibly one of the most badass vehicles in the sure. 70s, Yeah, which is just an armor-plated 55 Chevy with guns pointing out of it. When there are moments where the visuals really hold, I mean, you're doing these exploitation films fast. So if I sound like I'm putting down the film, it's sure. only because I'm making fun it's of exploitation nature, as yeah. a genre. But, you know, they, they have very minimal time to film this. Yeah. They obviously took th all of their resources and built this car. Yeah. And then car, there were no and resources. And then rent out a roller rink so that they could kill a bunch of people at a roller yeah. rink. So for the tone of what the movie does, this car is all that lives up to the bossery right. of how the characters are written. But then they couldn't pay anybody to, like, walk down the street with it. Sure. So <laughs> sure. Yeah, there's four people walking. It, like I told you, it just it just looks like riot footage. Sure, yeah. Some foreign country because there's just so few people on the street. Right. And there's a fire in the background. No matter how well done your uh, your small budget action film is you always know when there's not a lot of people yeah. on the street. When it's the same five no-name people fighting and uh, you have some crumbled up newspapers and a barrel fire. Yeah, and I still love every fucking minute of that battle scene. What about their chat on capitalism? That's a Oh, the uh, what was that? Capitalistic gangster? I don't know. That's such a silly thing to call somebody. You know, all of the, the movie's takes on economics and politics, the fact that it's in there is just humorous to me. We could have done a whole episode on laissez-faire, 
right? That could have been our yeah. fallback. God. It's uh, laissez-faire is, um, how do they describe it? Let do or leave it alone, I think, in the, yeah. in the movie. That kind of economic policy of, you know, hands off, which, I mean, as libertarians is totally awesome. Big thumbs up. Yeah. Well, now that we've gotten to libertarians, I'm going to save everybody and just uh, cut us off here. What are we uh, doing next time on the show? Next time, we're going to get really complicated and convoluted again. Oh, great. And we're going to pair uh, Rocky Balboa with Rocky Tokyo Six. Gore Police. <laughs> Rocky sorry, Six it's and finally Tokyo Gore to Police. to the point where it sounds funny. I don't know what you're talking last about. Time, I thought Kill Bill 2 time, and Rocky 4 was pretty crazy. Last time, Rocky 5 and the Machine Girl still <laughs> didn't tickle my funny bone but now now that it's not rocky six right now that it's rocky balboa and tokyo gore police sure it's that's the funny to me title. it sounds back on track because yeah. there isn't uh officially a number no in the title numbers so you can find all those old rock asia shows and our usual long drawn out explanation of why the hell we did that on our website doublefeatureshow.com and if you have any questions send us an email at doublefeatureshow at gmail.com fan fucking tastic look at that watch more fucking film you've got it i mean bye